This is Frog Valley Tropical Fruit Farm, and today I want to talk about um, an orchard floor, uh, how to create a healthy orchard floor from scratch here in Florida. Uh, I didn't do these videos when I first started out, and I sure wish I had because then I would have had documentation of everything. But when we started out, this was all lawn like that. I have one little bit left and it's very weedy and it was like a monocrop grass and it had been for 50 years because it's a 1960 or yeah 1962 house same age as me <laughs> so uh i have manure and and i Knew, found out that all the like alfalfa and stuff is being sprayed with um, weed killer and all the grains are the same thing so I really paid attention to what type of feed I was giving my horses and this was a horse pasture, the back property, five acres, was a horse pasture for the entire time this house was around. So 60 years, basically, 55 when we bought it, 54. And um, there, back there is, is, is probably our healthiest area now. And I don't have to really do too much to it. So. Um, I say manure and earthworm castings, but earthworms are most abundant in grasslands, not lawns. They need to have the, well, like everything else, the soil pH is a major thing. So in Florida, when you're driving on your lawn and mowing it, you are compacting the soil and uh, it's the heat from the water and the pH changes and um, it just isn't healthy. So you can't really cultivate a living uh, orchard floor with earthworm castings if you're mowing it. Also, if you're applying just one input, like all wood chips, that doesn't really, it compacts, first of all, in the depths that I've seen them, that compacts the soil and it's only feeding one thing. You want your system to be able to devour whatever you throw into it. So if I put an oak log into my um, orchard floor today, it would probably only last like two years, big giant oak log. So max. Within a year, it would be like half rotted. Today, that wasn't always the case. Um, we started out, I started out mowing the lawn and um, putting wood chips around my trees because they just, they looked horrible. I did not water them. I didn't water anything. We didn't have water, uh, a well yet for the irrigation. We have one now. We put one in like a year and a half after we got here. And, um, but the trees survived. They didn't need to be watered and that just kind of amazed me. Um, the orchard floor, it just, but it wasn't, they weren't growing. They didn't look healthy. The system did not look healthy. And then I started doing my research on soil health and discovered that disturbance is like the number one thing. So leave it the hell alone, which basically soil health, if you practice that, everything else will follow. So it's kind of all you need to know. And if you let the grass grow in there and you apply small amounts of manure, the earthworms will come, but it'll take time. And I started reading all these different natural farming methods and the Indian natural farming method and um, Korean natural farming method and um, I wanted to be biodynamic certified and so I like all these different formulas 
And the ones that fascinated me the most, because we grow mangoes, were the Indian natural farming methods. And, you know, they've been growing mangoes continuously, successfully for thousands of years. <clears throat> I know there's lots of issues with our Florida mango growers that are popping up. And that's because they are all pro-chemical. That's what they do here. And when you're pro-chemical, it's kind of common knowledge now that you're just so, you're destroying uh, the microbiome of the soil. <clears throat> and if you're using weed killers, you're killing earthworms. You, it's not, it's the opposite of what you want. So, these growing practices that we believe in are all natural and are good for earthworms and good for plant health. <clears throat> I think they've proven that they can't fix our citrus with their farming practices because the only thing they fixed was their brand being ruined forever worldwide. <clears throat> Nobody wants to drink insecticides or systemic fungicides or eat systemic fungicides. Nobody. So there's, I talk about biogenic VOCs and the biome and micro, the microbiomes, but the, um, most of these studies on biogenic VOCs are done on air pollutants and not on the air generated in a clean system. So these, these VOCs, these terpenes, these antioxidants, they float into the air and they go into the water. And if you have a healthy recycling system like we've got here with large trees and an orchard floor and all these plants, they kind of recycle all those back into the system. But when they're released into the air in a city or, um, you know, they go into the air and our air is polluted in most cases. And so it's polluted with anthropogenic pollutants. So uh, VOCs that humans cause. So when those uh, antioxidants go into the air, they create another gas that turns into ozone. <clears throat> and it's not the tree and plant uh, organic or biogenic VOCs that is the problem. It's the gas, the VOCs caused by the humans. <clears throat> it's like all of it's connected. It's polluted. It's human caused pollution that's creating our diseases in us and in plants and in animals. Because if you're using manures and you don't know where your feed comes from, you got to you got to just grow your own. That's what it comes down to. You got to grow your own feed. You can't really I know you cannot buy organic horse feed around here anyway. You can buy organic pellets, but a lot of times those get busted for having GMOs in them. So they like they're okay one year and then the next year they're not okay. Do not use. So you're best just not to use anything like alfalfa pellets. And just, if you can, grow your horses on a healthy, diverse uh, orchard floor. I'm not talking about the kind they do around here. They all mow their, their fields because they don't want sedge growing in there. But I don't think they've ever taken the time to look at actually what's seeded in their field. Because it's, you know, it's all basically a monocrop of sedge. <laughs> kind of, not all of it, but most of the horse farms around me are. The cattle farms, not so much, but the horse farms, all I see is sedge. But maybe the cattle farms are the same way, I don't know. So, back to the orchard floor. So what I did when I started, I did the lawn rings. I did the lawn and then I had the wood chips and then um, I did some research and I saw that, you know, do not disturb. And so when I saw that, and the more I uh, researched uh, uh, soil health and stuff, I discovered that just throwing the logs on would, would be good. And 
I started doing all these sprays from all these different natural farming things I did. I wouldn't make them exactly the biodynamic I did, but I would go out and I would find some humus on our property and I would make a tea out of that. So I'd put it in a paint strainer sack and I would leave it there for three days. And then I would fling it on, I'd spray it. I sprayed it, I hate doing foliars. I hate doing every type of spray you can think of. It's just, I don't know, it's, I did too much of it and it's like, it was too much. <laughs> but I just fling it now and I use pepper trees because they work really good. Uh, at flinging it onto the soil when I have to do stuff because I have to do BD 500 every year and BD 501 every year but um, that's all I do anymore I only do it once I don't even think I need that to be honest with you but I have to do it to stay certified biodynamic if I do but probably I will I work too hard to get that certificate unless they throw me out but anyway so I did that and I would do it that and then I would do a lab so I would do a, a lactose bacillus spray and then the next day I would do a um, compost tea spray and then the next day I would do a like a a bokashi leachate spray and I did that for five days a week on everything. I found out what sprays kill what trees. I mean, I put on everything, everything got it. And I did that every day for five days a week, you know, four or five days a week. <clears throat> I'm not sure exactly how many hours a day I did it, but it was long enough to make myself sick of doing it. I know that it was more than three hours a day probably between three and seven hours a day in the heat and because I was like what's wrong with the trees and every, and um, I'm like I know I got this figured out I stopped mowing the lawn and would do those sprays and put horse manure around scatter it I scattered the manure you know I only had two horses so it was like I'd scatter the manure and um, make compost and scatter that around. And it seemed, it was like a transition stage for the lawn. Cause the lawn, this up front half was a lawn for probably uh, six, uh, 55 years, 54 years when we bought it. And so, um, yeah, it was like, it was slow. It was like, it was, hard to get to happen get it to wake up one day I started mixing all my things together and just putting it on the orchard floor because I realized by then that some of these sprays were killing my Garcinia trees <clears throat> the you know the fermented stuff not the not the BD's fermented manure but the like the lab and the um, Bokashi leachate did not the big trees, but the little trees. Just burned them. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> one day I put the yeast, a yeast mix, started making a sourdough yeast, a wild sourdough yeast, and um, put that in there and did it a couple times. And it's like all of a sudden it like something woke up. So, what I would do today, if I had that, if I bought this property and it was just lawn and I wanted to rush, rush the system along to its most beneficial, I would do a crushed <clears throat> fruit like that you grow or organic it ha everything you have to know where everything comes from because everything today is polluted you can't even use wood chips because they're polluted in some cases so if you're going to be you know certified organic like we are i think we're the only uh rare fr tropical fruit farm that's certified with all these fruits. 
in the US and in the world probably. But um, this is just my experience and how I figured out how to grow everything. And it's everything grows here. I mean, I've kind of shown that. It's not like I'm like coddling these things along. I, uh, yeah, sure, you can't see all the trees, but there's mangoes and there's uh, mulberries and there's sapodilla and there's more mangoes and egg fruit and uh, other things growing in here. Bananas. This was like one of the worst areas. And finally, it's like getting good. It took a while. So what I would do today it was, is differently, is I would find the soil humus, because there's gotta be a spot around a, a old tree that you can find it, that you know is not like polluted with car oil or something like that, or exhaust. A clean source of it. And, um, Put that, crush some fruit, get raw zebu manure, and a little moringa, and then some sourdough yeast of like a multi-grain bread. I'd mix it all together and that's what I'd fling on there. And then I'd start making fermented compost. So the below ground compost, you know, the soil health thing, they got sidetracked trying to like eradicate anaerobic microbes. Well, in the process, you're killing all the microbes in your aerobic compost too. So it makes zero sense. And since the anaerobic microbes live inside the plant cell walls, you kind of need them. So please stop with the ignorance. I mean, I'm so over that. It's kind of a trigger in me. <laughs> when I hear, I'm gonna get rid of the anaerobic microbes. Uh, shut up. You don't even know what they are or what they do. So if you don't know what they are and what they do, then please shut your mouth and don't try to kill them. Let other people show how they work. I mean, don't need to bubble the compost or the, the compost tea. So uh, you put the water, you have to use clean water. Structured water is best. So a water that's been like uh, stirred a uh, hour or half hour, you know, with a vortex or something that you have uh, water structuring on your hose or something like that. But I think it's important, rainwater, <clears throat> sun exposed rainwater. So even rainwater can be polluted. So you want the edge. So put it in a five gallon bucket, put it in a paint strainer's bag, all mixed together. You know, it's like the size of a softball. By the time you're done, it's small little amounts. And put it in the straight mainer's bag and then soak it in the water for three days in the shade. Probably you don't even have to do it three days. Probably 24 hours would be sufficient, I would guess. And then like dilute it and fling it onto your, on your new ground. That's what I would do today, knowing what I know. The guavas are coming up. Oh, I was gonna check the citrus. The citrus is, we have organic citrus. Citrus is one of the easiest plants to grow here in Florida. <clears throat> and fruit. I've been on my organic citrus journey for three years. I've had a organic citrus tree in our beach house for 10 years, I guess. Almost 10 years. And, um... Any, anybody can grow it, grow them from seed and don't even have to water. You know, we don't water. I do water some grafted trees, like some of our older grafted trees, like the black sapote. 
but I don't have the water. I turn the water on usually in January and then I alternate it between a couple other uh, nursery grown trees for like five months on an artesian drip. So yeah, the living root, that's where the earthworms live. They don't live in the wood chip piles. <clears throat> the living root and the manure. And then I would, I would do it like, if I was doing it again and I didn't know, I would do it every, every day for like five days. That's what I would do. Or at least three days a week probably would be sufficient. It's so diluted and it's such minor amounts that it's like, you, c you can do it pretty much unlimited. I mean, you could do it all the time because your system would be able to absorb it, your living roots. This is like a 365 day a year carbon drip pump right into the soil, which is what sand needs. <clears throat> okay, so what would I do? I would do a raw zebra manure. I'd probably add that last, like the last day. So I would put the humus in there and I would put the milk in there and I would put some, like a handful of just soil in there um, from under like one of your trees and a healthy tree. And then I would put like a tablespoon of Moringa in there and then I'd crush some fruit up and put in there like a mango, organic mango, preferably grown on your property or a source you know is local. Don't want to use any fungicide infused mangoes. So anything that's been given systemic fungicides or copper's been put on it, absolutely not. Our citrus are changing color. It's like lemon season is coming up quick. So this is a our seed grown tree from our beach house fruit tree that is an old fruit tree and it's lemons. And this will be the first year I'm not gonna start any seeds from that tree. I'm gonna do seeds from these trees, the best one. I have a couple of trees, three trees that are fruiting right now. They're, these trees are gonna be three years old from seed and like January, I would guess. Very healthy trees. Um, we have some blood oranges that are super healthy and some uh, little tangelos and some other sweet citrus and rangipiri lime and uh, key lime and citron and pomelo. Australian finger lime, or yeah, that's it, finger lime. <laughs> Bokashi compost in there, tea, just a little bit of that stuff. little small amounts and then you dilute it and you fling it on the dirt on the grass I'm kind of surprised that people are still using chemicals to grow mangoes I mean and, and other tropical fruit trees here in Florida I don't know maybe they're just on pure rock or something like that I don't know but this part of Florida it knows how to grow fruit trees without any help from us. I know that. <laughs> I 
It takes time, it takes time before this orchard floor looked like this. This was a five year process. But I think that if I would have started right off knowing what I know now, I could do, could have done it in probably two or three years for sure. You gotta keep throwing wood chips at the system and logs and stuff like that. <coughs> I mean, I put so many pounds, like hundreds of pounds of wood chips from the farm because we had a tractor and we'd make our own. And um, I mean, the wood chips used to sit there for like a year around the trees when we first started out, but now wood chips don't have a chance here. what you want. This is like earthworm habitat if you add manure to it. Yeah, and while you're doing the the compost tea, add daily inputs of manure, but you have got to know where your uh, <clears throat> where your source of manure is coming from. You don't need to apply the manure all at once. Tons of it. For sure, the 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 clean zebu manure is best, for sure. I mean, it dissolves in water completely. Yeah, I wouldn't do the raw zebu manure unless I was going to spray it right away. I wouldn't be, like, cultivating it for microbes in water for days on end. It, I mean, probably works, but I just, I can't do that because of the organic. And then I gotta be cautious where and how I transport that, where I put it and how I transport it and where I transport it. You have to pay attention to all that stuff if you're organic. I'm so excited so many people are like trying to like grow organically and Florida tropical fruit trees because I know if enough of us start doing it that the world would start seeing eventually. They wouldn't think about, oh, all the polluted spaces where the citrus trees are. They'd be thinking of the miles and miles of gorgeous, exotic, expensive, rare tropical fruit <clears throat> being grown organically. Plants, 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 plants is the other input because more important than the manure. Anyway, this is Frog Valley Tropical Fruit Farm. I hope you have a good day.